this morning before we get into worship. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful, Lord, uh, God, just for the opportunity to be here this uh, this morning, Lord. We thank you, God, for your continued blessings, your continued provision and faithfulness, Lord, for every need, Lord. And God, just thank you for the ultimate gift, Lord, the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, Lord, who willingly went to the cross for us and gave himself for us as the propitiation for our sins, Lord. Uh, God, thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy, Father. We pray, Lord, that you would be blessed and honored by our worship here this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
together. Uh, the way that we do this is we start with the front row uh, on the inside of the road, work our way forward, uh, grab the sacraments, walk your way back to the outside of the road, and back into your seat. We'll do that from the front to the back. Okay? And then we'll take together. I'll lead us in that. Uh, but let's take a moment and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful, Lord. Uh, God, just for your many, many blessings, Lord God, and for your faithfulness for every need, Lord. Uh, Father, we know that every everything that we have is a gift from you, Lord. So today as we give of our tithes and offerings, Lord, we do it with a cheerful heart, Lord, and, and just pray, God, that you would multiply, Lord, and use it, God, for your glory, for your purpose, your kingdom, Lord. Uh, Father, we want to thank you, most importantly, Lord, for the gift of your Son, Christ Jesus, Lord. Uh, Lord, his willingness to go to the cross for us. Jesus says to himself that no man takes my life from me, but willingly I lay it down. Father, today we are coming to take of communion and of the Lord's Supper together in remembrance of His sacrifice for us, Lord, that it was His body that was broken for us and His blood that was shed for us, Lord. And uh, God, we are just so thankful, God, for the gift of grace through faith, Lord, that, that we receive eternal life, Lord, not by the, by the works of the flesh, Lord, but by, the, by Your grace and Your mercy, Lord. Thank You. Uh, Father, we just give You all praise, honor, and glory this morning. In Jesus Christ, name we pray. Amen. Amen. Take of this bread this morning. We do it in remembrance of the body that was broken for us. Take and eat. As so we take this juice, we do it in remembrance of the blood that was shed for us. Drink. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, again, Lord, I just thank you for Jesus, Lord, for your only begotten Son, who willingly gave himself for us, Lord. Thank you. Father, you alone deserve our praise, honor, and glory this morning. We just pray, God that you would be honored and blessed, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, church. We're going to go ahead and dismiss our children next door. Children's Church. <laughs> See, we have our newlyweds back <laughs> today. Great, guys. Alright, so listen, we're going to go ahead and turn in our bottles once again to the book of Romans. Uh, we're in Romans chapter 9 today. Just finished up Romans chapter 8 last week. Uh, spent a lot of time in Romans chapter 8, didn't we? <laughs> Still a lot to cover there. Uh, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot to cover. So uh, we're actually going to probably just work our way all the way through chapter 9 today, okay? Uh, believe it or not. Um, but you know, we've, over the past few well, a couple of months probably, just kind of going through the book of Romans, uh, we have seen how the Apostle Paul has instructed and taught us the, uh, of the doctrine of the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? I mean, the Apostle Paul, right off the bat, said one thing that I feel like that we need to also take to heart in our own hearts and our own minds is he says that I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? Uh, we should not treat the gospel of Jesus Christ as something that we're ashamed of, right? Because the Apostle Paul says that it is the power of God unto salvation. It alone is the power of God unto salvation. There's not another way of salvation or another door, another avenue that we can take to receive the gift of God's grace through His gift of eternal life. It's only through Jesus. And that's why the Apostle Paul says that he's not ashamed of it. But he says it's the power of God unto salvation. He says first for the Jew and then also for the Greek. Okay? And today we're going to look at where the Apostle Paul, he, he's kind of spent a lot of time uh, see, teaching on the, on, on the gospel. And now he's going to kind of move and transition to speak more about the sovereignty of God in, in regards to the gospel, right? And, and the sovereignty of God and, and his plan, uh, not only for salvation, but for in, in life in general, that God is sovereign. When we talk about the sovereignty of God, we talk about his Lordship over His creation, all right? That He is Lord and He is sovereignly ruling and governing over His creation. And uh, the Apostle Paul is going to kind of transition and start speaking more strongly in regards to the sovereignty of God. Um, and we kind of see that already just starting off here in uh, chapter 9, beginning with verse 1. But the Apostle Paul, last week we talked about that, you know, suffering isn't pleasant, right? But that suffering is, is inevitable, okay? Uh, that, that everyone will experience some suffering in their life uh, at some stage and at some point in their life. Uh, you know, the, Paul, the Apostle Paul says that he considers his affliction as momentary light afflictions 
Uh, we talked about how, man, how is that possible? When you look at the book of Acts and you see the Apostle Paul and his ministry and all that he suffered, right? I mean, he was rejected. He was, he was, he was uh, beaten. He was stoned. He was left for dead. But yet he can consider his afflictions as being momentary and light. And there, we talked about the reason that the Apostle Paul could do that, right? The reason that he could consider them as momentary light afflictions is because the Apostle Paul lived with an eternal perspective, right? The here, the now, was not what the Apostle Paul was living for. He was living, living for the kingdom to come. And that's why he could look beyond his circumstances and say, there's something that awaits me that's far better than this. And if I have to experience this here, that I might experience that there, then it's worth it, right? And ultimately, listen, church, the Apostle Paul also teaches us, right, the importance of, and the need for suffering in our own lives. That God uses suffering... Right to uh, to grow us and to strengthen us. Uh, uh, you know, James writes, you know, that, that, that we are to count it all joy, brethren, when we face many trials. Uh, he says, because trials produces patience. And then also he says that we're to let patience have its perfect work in us, that we may be perfect and complete and lacking nothing. You see, trials work in our lives. God doesn't let it go to waste. God uses trials. He uses suffering in our life to grow us and to strengthen us in our walk and in our faith. Uh, so, <clears throat> although they're not pleasant, God has a purpose for it. Okay? But all, uh, Paul would end up bringing us all back to the reality that God loves His children. Okay? He loves us. And Paul would say with such confidence that I'm, that I'm, I'm, I'm confident, right, that, that God's love will never cease. It will never fail me. And I, and I, I ended last week with encouraging us, let's remember that, right? Even in the midst of suffering, God does not cease loving us when He allows suffering to enter into our lives. God loves us in every detail, okay? He does. But He ends on that high note, but now He's going to kind of come back down to a more of a... Uh, 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 he's going to kind of bring it down a little bit, all right? And... Uh, and beginning with verse 1 of chapter 9, we're just going to kind of work our way through the first few verses here, and then I'm going to jump around a little bit. Like I said, we're going to probably end up at the end of chapter 9 uh, this morning when it's all said and done. Uh, but the Apostle Paul tells the church in Rome here, at beginning in verse 1, he says, I tell the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. He has grief in his heart for what? Well, he's going to tell us he has grief in his heart for his brother in Israel. Okay? In verse 33, he says, For I could wish that I myself may um, work a curse from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises, of whom are the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Just soak that in for a moment and think about what the Apostle Paul is saying here. All right, He says again in verse 3, For I could wish that I myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. The Apostle Paul is saying that my desire is to see my brethren Israel come to salvation through Christ Jesus. That's my desire. In fact, I have such a strong desire for it that I would be willing to be a curse from Christ myself in order that they may gain it. But what the Apostle Paul also knew is that he couldn't do that for Israel. You see, it, we can't. It's a personal choice and a decision to follow Christ. Amen? Amen? Like we can't make that choice and decision for somebody else, right? right. We can live and be the example. Right? We can, we can preach the gospel. And the Apostle Paul says some plant, some water, but it's God that gives the increase. Amen? Amen. But Paul would say, man, my heart, my zeal, my desire is to see, to see my brethren Israel saved. I've got to ask you, do you have a zeal to see the lost come to Christ? I pray that we have such a fire and a desire and a passion in our hearts and lives to be the example for others that, we, that they need to see in regards to their need for a Savior. Apostle Paul lived his life faithfully with great zeal for the Lord, passionately. And he had a love and a desire to see Israel come to faith. You see, Israel, and this is what the, openly the Apostle Paul is, is saying here, is he's saying, listen, Israel, they, they were God's people. God chose Israel to reveal His power, 
His, his greatness, His glory to the world. And it, if you look at the Old Testament, you would see on, on how many occasions that the Lord worked through Israel, right, to display great power, great glory. Now, Israel was not always faithful. Israel would fall away. But God was faithful to Israel. <laughs> um, Paul says here, he says in, in verse, uh, verses 4 and 5, you know, who are the Israelites to, who pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, you know. He's speaking of all that God had done for Israel. Uh, Paul says, listen, it all began with Israel, the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, the promises, even Jesus, according to the flesh, came as an Israelite. You know, Jesus, born of flesh, right? The God incarnate wrapped himself in flesh, but he was born an Israelite. He was born a Jew. And Paul is saying, I mean, Israel has a special place in the heart of God. Israel does. And the Jews would believe that if they kept the law, right, that they would receive salvation, that they would receive the kingdom of God in heaven. And the Apostle Paul is saying that, listen, why, if that were the case, why would Paul say, man, I would, I would sacrifice it all to see them come to salvation? You see, the reality is, is Israel couldn't earn their acceptance from, from God by works, right? right. I, I feel like that we have established that over the past few weeks when we look at the book of, of Romans, right? And we see what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 8 and 9. I mean, how much clearer can it be, right? For by grace we have been saved through faith, not that of, our, like, of ourselves. It's a gift of God and not of works, lest any man should boast. We talked about what justification is and that justific being justified before God is not based on what we have done, but it's based on what Jesus has done for us. And that we are justified by faith in His finished work on the cross of Calvary through His death, His burial, and His resurrection. That is the Gospel. And there's no other power under heaven and on earth that can be the, for which we may be saved except for by that name, Jesus Christ alone. And the, the, the Israelites missed that. You know, their, their Messiah that was promised to them, they rejected Him. And then ultimately they would crucify their Messiah. You know, and that's why in, uh, in, <clears throat> in verse um, 5 it says, Of whom are the fathers, and from whom according to the flesh Christ came, who is over all and <clears throat> the eternally blessed God. But in verse 6 it says, But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who, said, who, are, who, who um, are, are of Israel. Now what, is, what does Paul mean by that? That they're not all Israel who are of Israel. You know, there's a word, there's a, a, a meaning of the word Israel that is governed by God. You see what the Apostle Paul is saying? They may be born an Israelite, but they're not governed by God. <clears throat> Israel has always been special to God. In fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 15, it says that the Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them, and He chose their descendants after them, you above all people as it is this day. God loved Israel. God loved Israel. God had chosen Israel. He, they were His people. But if God loved Israel, then why wouldn't He save all of Israel? Well, because as Paul says in verse 6, they are not all Israel who are of Israel. A meaning of the word there again is governed by God. In Romans 8, chapter 14, Paul says, For as many are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Right? And we talked about what it is to be a child of God. The Bible tells us that we are adopted, grafted into the family of God. Right? That His Spirit dwelling within every believer, that we're all sealed with the Holy Spirit of God, that His Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. How do we know that we're a child of God? His Spirit alive, actively working in our lives. And, sh and He is our guarantee, our seal. And, but listen, church, how people know that we're children of God? Well, Jesus says they will know you're my disciples by your love for one another. By the fruits of the Holy Spirit working out actively in our lives when we submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and we allow His Spirit to live actively in our, in our life and, and produce that. Now listen, <laughs> here 
you know, it's speaking of being under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It's, it's speaking of Him being Lord of our life. And what does that look like? Well, church, that means that we, as followers of Jesus Christ, are in humble submission to His will, His purpose in our life. Where we are in daily surrender, right? Not living for ourselves, but living for Him. And that's what it is to submit to God. When the Bible says that we're to submit to God, that means that we're to place ourselves underneath His Lordship in our life. Israel had not done that to that extent. They were still trying to obey the law and gain their, their salvation by what they did. Instead of receiving their, their Messiah, they, He was there. You know, we've talked about, we've been going through the Gospel of John on Wednesday nights. And we've talked about man, all the miracles, all the works that you see that Jesus did. But yet the Pharisees would still persecute Jesus so, so intently, so intensely, so strongly. Even though they had seen the works of God through Christ, and yet they would still deny Him and reject Him. You know, they had missed the promise. And in verse 7 it says, Nor are they all children, because they are the seed of Abraham, but in Isaac your seed shall be called. He says that it is those who are, uh, are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. What's the promise that was given to them? The promise was Christ. The promise was the Messiah. In fact, in Isaiah... Over in Isaiah chapter 9, I want to read these couple of verses to you. Uh, Isaiah prophesying of the Messiah. Here in verses 6 and 7 says in chapter 9 of Isaiah, he says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and, and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. You see, this was the promise given to Israel. The promise of the Messiah, their deliverer, to, the, to be the governor over their, their, their nation. But listen, they missed the Messiah. We've talked about this in the past, that they missed Him because they were looking for something other than, than Christ. They were looking for a, 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 a ruler, somebody, that, that a military leader that would come and deliver them from their, uh, from their oppressors, right? And to reestablish Israel to be a great nation. But yet, the deliverer, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, didn't come to deliver them from man. He came to deliver them from sin. And they missed it. They missed it. It wasn't because they were, they, you know, God left something out in the details that He had given to them through the prophets. No, He had given them instruction, and they and they still missed it. And that's why Paul says here that they're not all Israel who who are of Israel. They're not all governed by God. They're not all followers of the Messiah. Because, you know, the Apostle Paul, again, makes it very clear that, listen, there's but one point, one way of salvation. Well, we can't, we can't earn it by our works. We can't do enough good things in this life to, 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 uh, to atone for our sins. We can't. The Bible tells us that there are none righteous, no, not one. That we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But yet Israel was still trying to live under the law. They were still trying to, uh, to, uh, to gain their salvation. And they had rejected their Messiah. <laughs> but then in verse 14 and 15, Paul writes, he says, What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not, he says. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whoever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whoever I will have compassion. Now I want to remind us that, listen, the Apostle Paul is speaking to the church in Rome. Alright? The church in Rome would have been primarily um, Gentiles. Alright? Those who were outside the Jewish faith. Uh, they, were, they were considered to be Gentiles. But yet he's speaking of Israel. And he's saying that Israel is not, listen, is not... Israel is not the only ones to inherit eternal life, right? The, the Greeks also will inherit it if they put their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ. That's why in Galatians, you know, the Apostle Paul says that there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. 
But we are all one in Christ Jesus. There is but one way of salvation, and that's through faith in Jesus Christ. But here, the Apostle Paul makes it clear that, listen, not everyone is going to enter into heaven. And that ought to break our hearts. Because there will be those, like some of the Israelites, who will reject the Messiah. They will reject Jesus. And it's a hard reality that many of us don't want to face, but that's true. The Bible tells us. There's but one way of salvation, and if you reject that way, church, then when you have rejected God's gift, Amen. you have turned your back on Him. And the Apostle Paul would say, who are we to question God on that? Is God unrighteous because of that? No. God ultimately is the only righteous one, and that's why it's not based on our righteousness, but we have to receive the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ in our own lives. That we clothe ourselves with Jesus. That we stand under the shed blood of our Messiah. That we understand that it's His, His, His sacrifice that has redeemed us. And that alone. Israel was God's people. But yet they would miss their Messiah. And my heart's desire, church, is that none of us here today would miss Him. But that we would see Him ultimately clearly. You know, I, I have determined in my heart to preach expository preaching from, you know, for, for many, many years now because I believe that it's the whole counsel of God that we need, church. Amen. We need the whole counsel of God. The Apostle Paul, speaking to the church in Ephesus in Acts, whenever he was leaving Ephesus, told the elders there, he says, The blood of man is not on my hands because I did not withhold from them the full counsel of God. Not everything that's in the Scriptures, church, is, 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 is all rainbows and butterflies, okay? There's some hard truth, but it's truth that we need. Jesus says, praying to His Father, He says, Thy Word is truth. He says, it's the truth that makes us free. We need the whole counsel of God, church. And listen, the Apostle Paul is telling us here that, listen, He, he is sovereign. He is Lord. And our participation is through submission to His Lordship. But yet many of us, many of us struggle with that. Now, let's be honest. We, we, surrender, we struggle with the idea of really just submit, surrendering to the Lordship of Jesus in our life. We, we, we still want to hold on to the reins, right? And, and still hold that steering wheel and think that we are captains of our own ships. But listen, listen. Let me warn you. Don't. Give Him the Lordship of your life. Let Him govern you. They were not all Israel who were called Israel. And church, let me tell you that you can't... They were, and what, oh, let me just read this little quote, uh, this note that I made here. It says, they might have been an Israelite, but they didn't automat that didn't autom automatically mean that they were a child of God. You can set up a cot in your garage and you can sleep there, but that doesn't make you a car. Alright? Amen. You can come faithfully to church every Sunday and sit in this church building, but that doesn't make you a Christian. Amen. That doesn't mean you're born again. No, those who are born again, those who are Christians in true identity, are those who surrender to the worship of Jesus Christ and receive Him as their propitiation. That He has satisfied the debt for you. He has paid it for you. And He has paid it in full. The Bible tells us in Hebrews that, that our high priest, He's not like the other Levitical high priests who have to stand at the temple day in and day out making offerings, but He is the once and for all offering for all sin. And that we don't have a high priest that cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but He was in all points tempted just as we are, yet without sin. Jesus bore our sins. He died our death. He paid it for us. And the power of the Gospel is that whoever, whomsoever, should believe on His name and call on His name shall be saved. Israel missed it. Not all of Israel, but some of Israel. And the Apostle Paul is saying, listen, that gift is not just for Israel, but that gift is for the Gentile 
It's for all of those. It's for the world. Jesus died for all. And all of those who enter in by faith and receive Jesus Christ as Lord shall be saved. Those who confess with the mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in their heart that God raised them from the dead will become a child of God. And that's not, listen, that's nothing that we have done. That's, that's what God's provision for us. And we enter in by faith. But the Apostle Paul, I mean, would continue to, uh, to uh, describe the sovereignty of God in salvation and how, you know, God has this plan of salvation and He's worked that plan out. And this plan is necessary for the redemptions, for the redemption of our souls, that we would place our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ. In fact, in verses 30, 31, and 32, I feel like I'm moving really fast this morning. We may end early this morning, church, are all like, yeah, I'm hungry anyways, let's go, let's go eat lunch, right? But in verse 30, the Apostle Paul says, what shall we say then, that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of they? But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained the law of righteousness. And there again, the Apostle Paul is saying, man, it's your righteousness can't get you there. You know, the Apostle James says that if a man desires to keep the whole law, but yet he stumbles at one point, he is what? guilty of it all. Guilty of it all. Like if you just make one little mistake, right? You miss one little detail, one little detail, and you're out. <laughs> That's a scary thought, isn't it? That's why we need to be so dependent and so appreciative of the grace of God. <laughs> the grace of God, right? His unmerited favor towards us. That yet, what Paul says in Romans, we've looked at this, God demonstrated His love towards us. What does that mean? That means He revealed it. He made it known. He manifested it before us. And it says that He, he demonstrated His love towards us that yet while we were still sinners. You don't get right before you get to God. You get to God so He can get you right. Amen. That's the truth of the Gospel. He says, yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He says, for a good man, a righteous man, one might die. <laughs> well, what about the rest of us? Jesus still died for us. Jesus still gave His life for us. He became our substitute. And He took our place. And He bore our sins at the cross of Calvary. And when it was all said and done, and He cried out, it is finished, church, He meant it was finished. Took our sins to the grave, and it says he buried them there. Aren't you thankful for that? Amen. Yes. Now, I'm not just talking about our past sins. Yes, I'm talking about our present and the future ones. Because listen, we're all being sanctified. Yes. We're not there yet. But God's doing a work in His in His faithful children. And, and listen, church, hard. Like I said before, our participation in that is our willingness to submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ in our life. We let Him be Lord of our life. And we continue to surrender every detail to Him and say, God, I need You. I need You to be captain of my ship. I need Your governing authority in my life because, listen, I don't know about you, but I'm real good about messing things up. Amen. Am I the only one? No. No, no. no see, I... We have to be dependent upon the Lordship of Jesus Christ in our life and submit to His Holy Spirit actively living in our lives and letting Him direct our paths, guide us, and, and give us um, discernment of things and give us the, the ability to see things the way that He wants us to see them. Because church, there's a lot of deception out there. We know that the devil is a liar and the father of lies. And, and uh, I'm telling you, church, that it's real easy in these days with all the, the information age that we're in to be led astray. Yeah. And that's why we have to be so grounded in the Word of God. You know how much I emphasize that here because it's so important. Because He desires to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus has come that He may give us life and life more abundant. Church, listen, that life more abundant is a life that is fully surrendered to the worship of Jesus Christ. And we give Him His rightful place in our lives and say, Lord, Captain me. And here Paul says in verse 
31, he says, But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained the law of righteousness. He says, Why? Because they did not seek it by faith. They didn't seek it by faith, church. What is faith? Hebrews 11, 1 tells us it's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith opens our eyes to the reality. It gives us the ability to see the gospel of Jesus Christ and to know that it and it alone has the power of God to save us. And they missed it. They missed it because they were putting faith in works instead of faith in God. He says, why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. You wonder what that is? He tells us, Verse 33 says, As it is written, Behold, I lay a, a, in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him, him will not be put to shame. That stumbling stone, that stumbling rock was Christ. He was there. He was in their midst. That promise that was given to them so long ago of the Messiah, He was there. And instead of being the rock of their salvation, He became a stumbling stone. Because they overlooked Him and they, they were looking for something other than Jesus. If you're looking for something other than Jesus, you're going to miss. You're going to miss Him. But here it says, whoever believes on Him will not be put to shame. You see, it's faith, church. It's grace. God's grace, His gift to us. But it's received by faith. We have to put our faith and our trust in the Gospel of Jesus Christ, in Jesus alone. Also, Paul says, it's not our place to question why God, why God would allow some to go to hell and some to go to heaven. He said, I've given it all. I've paid the price. I have given you your provision." Don't look for another way. This is the way. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And no one will enter to the Father except by me. And I'm, I pray that I'm preaching to the choir here this morning. That we have all given our hearts and our lives to Jesus Christ. And allowed Him to be the Lord of our lives. But if you're struggling with that here this morning, be real with God. God knows your heart. He knows your every thought, your every intention. You can't conceal it from Him. Confess it. Bring it before God and say, God, I see you. And I want to turn. And I want to give my heart and my life to You fully and completely. Let that be your decision this morning. The Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. That's all inclusive. God has already given you all that is needed for the, for the work of your salvation. You can't do it without Him. Give yourself to Him fully, completely. But church, for those who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I pray that we can have such a passion in our hearts to see the lost come to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Listen, I don't know about you, and I'm guilty. I spend a lot of time sometimes, and, and i got to catch myself, just complaining about all that's happening going on in our world, and all the problems and complications of it. And then i got to remember, oh, should I be surprised? The world's just doing what the world does. My duty, my, resp my responsibility is, be, is to follow the Great Commission and to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. To be a vessel, an instrument for God to use here that I might make a difference by, by sharing the gospel because the gospel is the power of God. We must be willing vessels to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in our life and say, God, I'll go where you send me. God, I'll do what you tell me to do. And that's through submission, church. So that's my prayer for us this morning, church. And I pray that you would answer the call today. And that you would say it's yes to God and whatever He's required of you this morning. Don't walk out of these doors not having made a decision for Christ to say yes to Him.
please stand as we go into a moment of invitation. As Cody and the band plays through this song, I want to encourage you to listen if the Lord has ministered to you in any way. If He has spoken to your heart and you know that, don't leave here not having responded to Him. Say yes today. If every other day you have said no, let today be the day you say yes to Give Him your all, your everything. That's the invitation this morning. And if you need prayer this morning, I'll be here for this song. Would you please come as they play the song? Here I am to worship, here I am to wonder, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to
Okay, uh, some of y'all know already that we were in an accident Thursday. Um, I'm going to share with you the how the morning started about 5.30 in the morning. And uh, we were having a conversation going down Magnolia Road about uh, what Jesus did on the cross. And my husband made a point to say that made me think about it in a way that I'd never really thought about it. And he says, uh, you know, he even took on the sins of rapists, murderers, child molesters, and uh, things like that. And I'm like, you know, I never thought about it like that. We're sitting there with tears in our eyes. And then at the same, and followed by a man, uh, and I'm assuming it's a man anyway, a white truck swerved into our lane, um, you know, coming straight towards us. He was very close. I had no choice but to swerve over and try to miss him. Henry seems to think that the guy did it on purpose. I don't know, it's not for me to figure out, but um, when we hit the wet grass, uh, our car started sliding sideways and we hit a pole and there was a culvert there which caused our vehicle to flip over. And uh, of course the truck kept going and uh, we had our dog with us, uh, he didn't have a seatbelt on, but I'm claustrophobic. And she when was I can, her seat belt upside down. What I can tell you, though, my point is, is that if you want to know just how much Jesus really loves you, the entire time this happened, I felt like I was being held by feathers, like I could literally feel them around me. And um, when everything uh, got quiet, everything stopped. I wasn't focused on that. I took my focus off of that and I started panicking because I'm claustrophobic and I felt trapped. He let my seatbelt down and I started screaming, oh my God, let me out of here, let me out of here. And then all of a sudden I hear this voice say, you're okay, open the door. And I stopped and I looked at the door and I just popped it and it just opened and we crawled right out. Uh, we then started looking for a dog. There was an axe in the car. There was two saws. There was hammers. You name it. Um, any one of those that could have hit us in the head and killed us. Our dog was safe and sound. She was hiding underneath a bunch of tools. Um, and then uh, people started stopping. And uh, their paramedics get there. They're like, Y'all are okay? We're like, yeah, we're fine. They're holding our dog. And uh, we're praying for the guy that caused the accident on the side of the road. And, you know, my husband's praying loud enough where everybody can hear. Uh, like, we're not the same people we used to be, and I know that. And um, I'm so thankful for that. And, um, but the next day, um, I get up and he's sitting at the table reading his Bible and, um, and he's sitting there crying. I'm like, what's going on? And he's like, and he reads this to me out loud. And then we're standing there both crying. <laughs> and, um, and it's Psalm 61, verses 3 and 4. It says, For you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter of your wings. And, uh, and that just really made me, it made me realize that, I mean, I am protected. I am covered in the blood. That's why I have my red shirt on today. Uh, so whatever you may going through, you know, just know that God is with you. You just got to know that, believe that, stand firm on that, have faith in that walk by faith and not by sight. And now we're in a position to where we don't have a choice but to do that. Mm -hmm. We have no money in savings. The insurance company is not covering the vehicle because we didn't make contact with another vehicle. There's no proof whether or not that car had insurance or not. So, I mean, that's just, that's it. I mean, and I'm kind of excited to see what God does now. At the same time, I'm human. Scared? No. 
So just kind of keep us in your prayers and We're going to keep you on our prayers, Tabitha and Henry, and we know that the Lord will provide. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's about, how, about a one, two, three, hallelujah this morning. We'll just, one, two, three. Hallelujah. Amen.